Welcome to Harbour Church. My name is Rob Sharp and I'm the pastor of Harbour Church. It's so great that you're with us, whether you're already part of our community or you've recently connected with us through our online services. It'd be fantastic to hear from you. So get in touch by emailing or on Facebook. Our church's vision is to be a life changing community for Christ. So we're going to be praising God and praying to Him. We'll meet the living God through His Word to us and our lives will be changed. Harbour Church is a community for all ages. So make sure you connect with our Harbour Kids and Harbour Youth Ministries. The details are on our website. Let's begin our service by praising our awesome God together with a song. church this morning we're going to introduce a new song um, it is called living hope and some of you may have heard it on christian radio if you listen, listen to christian radio uh, but if not that's okay we're going to get alex to sing through the first song or the first verse sorry uh, to introduce it for you and we'll see how you go from there please join us after that
morning and welcome to Harbour Church. It is great to be with you this morning in this online form and we continue to look forward to the time that we'll be able to meet together again in person. My name is Dan, I'm one of the members of Harbour Church and I'll be leading us through this service this morning and whether you're one of our regular members or whether you're somebody that's just dropping in on the service today, it is great to have you joining us from home or wherever you are. What we do when we meet together as a church at Harbour Church is the same whether it's online or whether it's in person. What we're meeting to do is to exalt our great God. In Exodus chapter 15 verse 2 it speaks about the fact that God has given us the victory and so we praise him. And that's what we do this morning, that's what we do every Sunday when we meet together. We praise and exalt our God for the victory that he has given us. And we'll be continuing to do that this morning through singing, through hearing from his word, through talking to God, and through hearing about the things that he's doing here, right here in our community. Now at the moment, if you ha uh, are just visiting us today or haven't been a part of the series recently, or just have a short memory, what we're doing is going through a series called Respectable Sins. Not that we really do respect sins, of course, but these are the things that creep into our lives that we maybe tolerate or aren't aware of, which are nonetheless sins and things that God would like to redeem and rescue us from. Today, we're thinking about envy and jealousy. They're not words that we often speak a lot about. You know, Shakespeare referred to envy as the green sickness. Uh, Francis Bacon said that envy knew no holidays or something like that. Uh, it's true, isn't it? Envy and jealousy can sneak into our hearts and corrode us and never leave. And today we're going to talk about that, honestly. Look at what God's Word has to say to us and look at what the Gospel has to say to how we change in those areas. I'm looking forward to hearing from God's Word as we hear about those things. Before we go any further though, I'm going to lead us in prayer as we begin our service. Following that, I'm going to lead us in a confession that we'll say together, that will come up on the screen. We meet together not as people who claim to have some righteousness of our own, but as people who know and are aware of our failures. And yet we bring them to a God who loves and forgives. And so we are going to begin our time by confessing our sin to God and reminding ourselves of his grace and forgiveness. So please join with me as I pray. And at the end of that, I'll ask you to join with me where you are in saying this confession together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can meet together this morning. We thank you that though we are isolated, we are not alone. We remain part of your body, the church. But we thank you most of all that we are not alone because you are with us. You haven't given up on us. You have loved us. You have come to us and lived a perfect life for us. You died on the cross for us. And now your spirit is with us and in us and among us. This morning as we meet together as a small part of your church, we pray that you would be growing our hearts to love you more, to serve you more faithfully, and to love others in response more willingly. As we think today about envy and jealousy, uh, we pray that you would break down the walls in our hearts that want to deny how sinful we really are, so that you can enter and change us to be more like Jesus. And we pray this in his name. Amen. Let's pray this prayer of confession together. Heavenly Father, we praise you for adopting us as your children and making us heirs of eternal life. In your mercy, you have washed us from our sins and made us clean in your sight. Yet we fail to love you as we should and serve you as we ought. Forgive us our sins and cleanse us by your grace, that we may continue as members of Christ in whom alone is our salvation. Amen. And be assured as we pray that prayer to God, he does forgive us because Jesus' death on the cross was enough to cover every sin. It's great news. Well, it's time now for a kid's spot and some notices. <laughs> Hello, I'm Montague McBrain, Bible professor. I study the things that Jesus taught and the way Jesus lived. Oh, 
Hello. You may have heard that Jesus told his followers to love their enemies and do good to those who hate you. Well, God's people have always strived to live out this teaching, but it's really, really hard. For example, I had this really awesome BMX bike. It was like the best bike ever. And there's this guy at school who nobody likes. And he said he, he really needed a bike for something really important. I thought, well, I could do something really loving by letting him borrow my bike. But then he gets on my bike and he does this really big jump and he, and he breaks my bike. So now I don't have a bike anymore. Does God know what that feels like? At school today, I saw this kid and he's getting beat up and I wanted to I wanted to help him. And so these guys, they were beating up this little kindy kid and I said, hey, stop it. And then they, they hit me in the face. <laughs> Does God know what this feels like? Yeah, I've been reading this really amazing book and in it is this real story about this guy called Romulo who lived in Peru and he tried to live God's way. And this bunch of terrorists just came around and, and Romulo tried to tell them about how much God loves them, but instead they got out a gun and they shot him. This guy was killed because he tried to tell someone that God loved them. Does God know what that's like? Does God even understand? Does God know just how hard it is to live this way? This is a question of gigantic proportions, but to answer it, we need to remember that Jesus is God. Jesus loved all people. He loved those who loved him, and he loved those who hated him. Jesus loved all people. Some people loved him in return. Other people hated him and, and beat him. And others, they killed him. So, God does know how hard it can be to love your enemies. He went through it all, so he knows how awful it can feel. Which means, when you love all people, even your enemies, you are being like God. I'm Montague McBrain, Bible Professor. This message has been brought to you by Harbour Kids. Big question. Why did Jesus tell parables? Jesus told parables to teach people about God and his kingdom. Welcome back to Harbour Youth, homies. Woo! On Sunday, the 5th of July, we're heading back to church to be gathered as we meet the living God through his word, uh, to exalt him with prayer and with praise and, and to share our lives again. It's going to be fantastic. Now, it's been a strange time uh, to not be able to do church like we used to. And, and it's been so long now that it's almost become the new normal. Very strange, I know. In fact, some of you uh, might find it hard to get out of bed a bit earlier on a Sunday morning and leave behind the comfy couch and the warm home, but it's going to be worth it. And once you've experienced church again, I know you'll agree with me. After all, Jesus died so that we can gather together. In Hebrews 10, we read, Brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, let us draw near to God. And let's remember who we are. You are a royal priesthood, a holy people, a special possession that you may declare the praises of him who brought you out of darkness and into his wonderful light, as we read in 1 Peter. 
I'm looking forward to doing church again with you. Now there's some information I'd like to share with you now about coming back to church. Firstly, the wardens and I are working with the Shell Harbour Anglican College to use their site safely for us and for the college. They've given us approval to use the site according to the procedures we've put together. And so secondly, please care for others by supporting those procedures. That means we'll be social distancing on entry, during the service, and as you head home. In fact, one way that we can love others is that during the service, every adult will be uh, social distanced so that those who don't come with others aren't made to feel isolated. Also, we're required to sign people in uh, when they come to church, and that means collecting information of new people, and we will manage that information securely. It's important that we care for each other by not attending if you have the symptoms of fever, sore throat, coughing, or uh, shortness of breath. Through church, we're going to be asking you to clean your hands regularly, and we'll provide the things that you need to do that. Cleaning will be done before and after church. Sadly, we won't be singing for the short term, which is a shame, but let's kind of keep in mind Christians who face persecution for even speaking about Jesus, let alone meeting together. Thirdly, not everyone will come back to church straight away, and that's okay. Uh, that's for a number of different reasons, and we will support you. Uh, we're going to be setting up a live stream through YouTube so that those people can continue uh, to join in the service through online. And lastly, if you've never been to Harbour Church but you've joined us through the online service, we'd love to meet you. I'm looking forward to saying hello and welcoming you into our community. Our vision is to be a life-changing community for Christ. God has been doing great work when we've been apart, but he's going to continue to do even more life-changing work when we come back together. I'm looking forward to heading back to church and I'm looking forward to seeing you. Well, hi, everybody. Uh, my name's Rob and I want to introduce to you Jono. Uh, it's great to have Jono Ward with us this morning. He's going to be preaching to us later on which is going to be fantastic. Some of you will remember Jono for his time with us. Others, he'll be new. Uh, and so I thought, look, it'd be great to hear from Jono kind of what's been happening. Now, Jono, you and Karina joined us in 2011, which feels like forever yep. ago. And you're with us for three <laughs> years. And it was so, so great having you partner with us uh, for that time. So, you know, what's been happening since then, uh, give us a day-by-day -day account. Uh, look, yeah, what's the highlights, brother? Yeah, look, oh, I, I loved, we both loved our time at Harbour Church. It was just uh, an awesome season of our life. We even stayed an extra year. So, you know, I was doing MTS with you guys and that was two years, but we were like, no, let's do, let's do three. So um, we finished up in 2013 and um, then I went to Moore College from 2014 to 2017. Um, and that was just, that was a really amazing time just to pause everything, get deep into the Bible, learn all about who God is and what he's done um, and, uh, and get equipped for a lifetime of ministry. So that was, just, that was just a really great four years spent. Uh, very busy. We, we added two kids to our family in that time. So Charlotte, our oldest was born in 2015. So she's five this year. Which that's flown. Um, and, and Harry, uh, is, is, our, is our youngest, he was born in 2017, so he's three this year. Just started preschool, so he's, he and Charlotte uh, wander into preschool together hand in hand, so that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a big moment for me as a dad. Yeah, so we, we, we've been to church uh, uh, at uh, Croydon, um, um, as well as at college, and, and we moved to Yaguna halfway through, which is near Bankstown, so widely different experiences of church over, over college. Um, and then after college, uh, I was offered a job up here at Wentworth Falls in the Blue Mountains. Uh, at the moment, it's freezing cold and, uh, and, and, and wet, so we're missing the beach. Uh, but there's a, it's a beautiful part of the world to live. But um, yeah, I, I've been working with youth here at Wentworth Falls Anglican Church um, since, well, this is third year now. So there's the play-by-play. -play. 
And so you've been working with youth as well as I'm guessing other, other areas of ministry. And so at, at Wentworth Falls, Holy Trinity, so fancy. That's right. Um, <laughs> well, we don't have a harbour, so. How has God been surprising you? Look, I, um, so many ways. Um, I think, uh, I think the more you get to know how God works, the, 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 the humbler you become. So, um, I'm, I'm employed here as a youth minister. Um, and I do, I do a lot, like I said, I've got a lot of, um, other responsibilities as well, but, um, I think I just reflect on 1 Corinthians 1 where, where, where Paul says that God uses the weak things of the world to shame the strong, um, the foolish to shame the wise. And I think the most surprising thing about the way God works is, which shouldn't be surprising, but it is, is uh, you can never really pick the people who he chooses to, you know, um, to, 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 to give you to mold and grow and grow and encourage you. And, um, and uh, you know, it's the person you're not really expecting to make that really difficult choice to follow Jesus in some way. That's, that's super encouraging and amazing. Um, or, or that person to take up the baton of leadership that you're not expecting. I think, I think, just seeing how God works in, in people in surprising and amazing ways is kind of the biggest thing, I think. Yeah. Yeah, fantastic. And so uh, even the Blue Mountains has uh, experienced COVID-19. You have not yeah. been there. How has God been growing you through this time? Yeah, this is, this is such an incredible moment in history. It's just... I, um, I, I sometimes just have to pause and sort of take myself out of my own skin and go, what is going on here? Um, uh, and uh, yeah, we were a hotspot for a little while. There was a, a, um, there was a, a, a positive case at Boddington, which is our local retirement village, which was, that, that could have been horrendous, but thank the Lord it was, um, it was sort of quarantined fairly quickly. So uh, no one, no one was impacted there. So yeah, we were, we were right in the middle of it. Um, uh, but I think I've, I've been reading Acts lately uh, in my quiet times and seeing seeing how God works even through the most the worst situations it seems for His glory. It just comes back time and time again in those early chapters of Acts. So you know Peter and John going to the temple, helping out you know a lame man getting thrown in prison, dragged in front of the courts. You know pretty difficult situation, but God uses it for His glory and the and the way the gospel goes forward. So I think I think. Um, God's been growing me to trust him in, in all the craziness of change and difference of doing ministry and not being able to see people um, and, and minister to them, pass to them. So I think I've got a tendency to trust myself and my own ability and my own, you know, smarts or lack thereof or whatever it is. Like um, if, you know, if there's an issue, why just think, how do, what do I need to do to fix this? I can't fix COVID-19. I can't fix not being able to meet together. So I've, I've, I've really learned to be humble in just um, seeing how God uses someone like, you know, me to help his glory go forward, which is super humbling. Like that's just, yeah. Uh, it's great to have you joining in our series on respectable sins. So what's the one thing you've been struck by as you've prepared to share with us about envy and jealousy? Yeah. I think the one thing that, that struck me um, is is the the insidious nature of them both. Um, I think they're respectable because we all struggle with envy and jealousy. And we call the same thing both words, but actually there's a difference and we'll, we'll go into that a bit, late, a bit later. But I think particularly envy, um, the fact that it lies at the heart of a lot of the issues in terms of our relationships with others, our relationship with God, um, the bitterness we sometimes feel, the defensiveness of, of we sometimes display, I think... Um, it's, I've been struck by how much envy I have, uh, that I didn't think I did. So, um, yep. it's, uh, it's been challenging, but I think also, um, what struck me is when you start focusing on what God's done for you, uh, your envy starts to evaporate. And I think if you're struck by the gospel and meditate on the fact that Jesus died to save us from our sin and that we all stand in front of God in need of his grace. I think that's, that's the place to start to, um, to start to deal with envy. So that's what I've, I've sort of been struck by, I think. Fantastic. And uh, it's going to be great to hear it in a little bit. And so thanks again, Jono, for partnering with us uh, here at Harbour Church. And please pass on our blessings uh, to Karina and the kids.
Oh, it's so excited. I'm so excited to be joining you in some way. We were hoping to get there uh, you know, physically, but even, even joining you in this way has been a real privilege. So thanks, Rob. Good morning. My name is Glaucia and I'm going to lead us in prayer this morning. Before we pray, I'm just going to read from Psalm 100. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is good. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you because you are good, because your love endures forever, and we are thankful for your faithfulness. We thank you because Harbour Youth had resumed their face-to-face -face meeting, face -face meetings on Friday and for the youth leaders. We pray that you continue to bless them as they get together. We pray, Lord, for countries that continue to struggle with many coronavirus infections. We ask your hand of mercy be upon them and that they find ways to recover. We praise you, Lord, as restrictions are lifted in our country as we continue to experience low number of infections. We pray, Lord, that this will allow us to be hopefully gathering together soon so that we can um, enjoy fellowship to, um, together. We thank you, Lord, for the college and for the SEC Crusaders group as they offer space for kids to hear your word and have the opportunity to take steps into getting to know you. We thank you for their leaders and they continue to uh, keep providing them with encouragement. For all these things, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, Harbour Church. My name is Corey and I'm going to be doing the Bible readings for us this morning. The first reading is from 1 Samuel chapter 18, verses 1 to 16. I'll give you some time to flip to it. And as you do, I might pray for us. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. Please be with Rob this morning as he preaches from it. In Jesus' name, amen. 1 Samuel chapter 18 from verse 1. After David had finished talking with Saul, Jonathan became one in spirit with David and he loved him as himself. From that day, Saul kept David with him and did not let him return home to his family. And Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. Jonathan took off the robe he was wearing and gave it to David, along with his tunic and even his sword, his bow and his belt. Whatever mission Saul sent him on, David was so successful that Saul gave him a high rank in the army. This pleased all the troops and Saul's officers as well. When the men were returning home after David had killed the Philistine, the women came out from the towns of Israel to meet King Saul with singing and dancing, with joyful songs with, and with timbrels and lyres. As they danced, they sang, Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. Saul was very angry. This refrain displeased him greatly. They had credited David with tens of thousands, he thought, but me with only thousands. What more can he get but the kingdom? And from that time on, Saul kept a close eye on David. The next day, an evil spirit from God came forcefully on Saul. He was prophesying in his house while David was playing the lyre, as he usually did. Saul had a spear in his hand and he hurled it, saying to himself, I'll pin David to the wall. But David eluded him twice. Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with David, but had departed from Saul. So he sent David away from him and gave him command over a thousand men. And David led the troops in their campaigns. In everything he did, he had great success because the Lord was with him. When Saul saw how successful he was, he was afraid of him. But all Israel and Judah loved David because he led them in their campaigns. Our second reading this morning is going to be from Titus chapter 3, verses 1 to 8. Titus chapter 3, from verse 1. Remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities, 
to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good, to slander no one, to be peaceable and considerate, and always to be gentle toward everyone. At one time, we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of our God and our Saviour appeared, he saved us, not because of the righteous things we'd done, but because of his mighty mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Saviour, so that, having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying, and I want you to stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. Well, good morning, Harbour Church. It's fantastic to be part of your service this morning. Uh, even though we're not able to come uh, and be a, a part of things physically, to be able to meet with you digitally is still a privilege. So thank you for having uh, me come and speak to you this morning. Let me pray. Almighty God, we thank you so much that you give us your spirit and that by it we can live. We pray that you'd help us to be challenged and convicted as you confront the sin in our life that we hold dear. Help us to, to change, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, when Karina and I were living down in Shell Harbour, we were driving up Mount Oosley one day uh, with trucks all around us and cars whipping past, and we drove right past an emergency turn bay and our car basically blew up. Smoke billowed out, the car wouldn't go any further, uh, the engine was just dead, uh, the thing was overheating, and basically Karina were like, we have to get out of the car, we're either going to get squashed or blown up. Uh, and, um, and as cars flew around us, we, we, we got out of, the, out of the car safely, got to the side of the road, called the NRMA uh, to get us towed out of danger. And we found out later that the reason the car kind of blew up, basically, was that uh, I hadn't been very good at putting oil into the engine, which a car needs, apparently. And so the engine had been just getting drier and drier and drier, the pressure had built, and bang, the head gasket had blown off. It's uh, it blown out of the engine. And sometimes, the Christian life can be a little bit like that, can't it? We look good on the outside, everything's running seemingly well, but on the inside, we've forgotten to put oil into the engine and things are running dry. And as we do more and more damage, as we don't confront these, uh, the, the sins that we tolerate, our engine can blow. And so t today, we're going to pop the hood of the engine of our life to check the oil and to make sure that things are working okay. I'm going to do this by confronting the sins that we tolerate. You've been going through this series called Respectable Sins and Rob's asked me to, to come and speak on envy and jealousy. Obviously he needs a, an expert in this field, but we're going to be popping the hood of the engine of our, of, uh, of our lives to, to check how we're going following Jesus in this area. And the thing is, I'm not just an expert in this, we all are. And that's what makes envy and jealousy particularly dangerous, tolerable sins. Because we can all emphasize with it, can't we? There's that particularly gifted person that we just envy, that we steer conversation away from, that we kind of subtly exclude from our social gatherings. There's that marriage that we just wish we could have or that, that, uh, that job we wish we could get or that position that we wish was ours. That feeling of gut-wrenching uh, that gut-wrenching fear when we feel threatened. The way success of others feels bitter in the darkest, part of, the darkest parts of our hearts. Envy and jealousy is something that we all struggle with. But I wonder if you can tell the difference between the two. We use envy and jealousy to mean the same things, basically. But the Bible actually draws a difference between the two terms. It expo the exposes that as sins we tolerate, they're, ex they're respectable on the outside, but they're incredibly destructive. And they're actually the cause of a lot of our issues in our relationships. So here's the difference. Jealousy is guarding something we already have. Whereas envy is wanting to have something we don't. 
Jealousy is guarding something that we've already got. Envy is wanting something that we do not have. So, for example, Billy is jealous of the time his parents spend with his brother, but envies his friend's Xbox. Sally is jealous of how easily Rhonda can explain the Bible in growth group, but she envies Florence's marriage. Jealousy is wrapping our hands around something and saying, Mine! While envy is looking at something that we don't have and saying, I want that! The problem is that they're not harmless. Jealousy is usually driven by fear, suspicion and distrust, whereas envy is usually driven by greed, by inferiority and by resentment. And our relationships with people and God are poisoned by these two things. To the point where in Galatians chapter 5, Paul says those who are envious and jealous won't actually inherit God's kingdom. So these are sins that we need to confront and not sins that we need to tolerate. Because if we confront them, then God by his spirit will help us to change and to follow Jesus in these two areas. So we're going to look at what jealousy is, what envy is, and then right at the end, how do we deal with both of them? We see jealousy in, clearly in 1 Samuel chapter 18, which we had read for us earlier on. It's the account of Saul's descent into fear and madness, beginning with his jealousy of David. Now Saul starts out amazed at David's ability uh, to, to, to be used by God to save his people. He triumphs over Goliath, and he keeps, so he keeps him around to kind of, you know, as a bit of a, a lucky charm. But things start to turn around when David starts to get all the praise from the people. And Saul doesn't get as much praise as him. Uh, in verse seven, the people. Uh, sorry, in verse seven, the people danced and sang. Saul has slain his thousands, and David his tens of thousands, and that really gets Saul's goat. David is praised for the triumph over the Philistines, while Saul is pushed to the side. This, the more that Paul, that Saul pushes David to do, the more he achieves, and the more danger David is put in the better he does. Saul starts to lose his grip on, san- on his sanity as he's pushed further and further into jealousy by David's success. And his jealousy blinds him to just how far he goes to guard his position of power and authority. He tries to stab David with a spear twice, puts him in the most dangerous part of the fighting in battles, hoping some Philistine will take him out. And Saul is so blind to what he's doing, he can't see how destructive his behavior is. And the passage keeps saying that Saul is afraid of David. Firstly, in, uh, in verse 12 and also in verse 15, Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with David and had departed from Saul. What was that fear? Well, the fear was that David was going to be better than him more popular, have more authority, more connection to God. That fear made Saul blind to his own sin, so he didn't deal with it. And finally, his jealousy drove him to chase David into the wilderness and obsess about destroying him. It ultimately brought Saul's downfall. And it shows us just how destructive jealousy can be. As we get tunnel vision, fixating on the person we're jealous of, we are blinded to the depths of our own sin. One way we're twisted uh, by jealousy is by delighting in the failure of others. Uh, The Germans come up with a lot of great words for different things, and one word they have for this feeling is Schandenfreude. Now, if you speak German, I've probably just massacred that word, but uh, this is the word that describes our feeling of pleasure at the misfortune of others. Having that smug feeling when someone's ministry event fails or when no one turns up to a birthday party or when someone fails a test or needs to, help for, uh, needs to ask for help, or most despicably, when we rejoice when that all-too-perfect person stumbles and falls from the faith. To diagnose jealousy, we need to interrogate our hearts. 
who are the people we love to see fail? Why would we love to see them fail? What are we afraid of if that person succeeds? Now, by asking ourselves those hard questions, we'll be able to see if jealousy has a hold of us. And so we can confront it and move on. Now, you might be thinking, Jono, hang on, hang on. What about God? Isn't he jealous? Yes. In Exodus chapter 20, verse 5, in the Ten Commandments, no less, God describes himself as a jealous God in the second commandment. This shows us that there is some jealousy that is good. So, how does God describe it? This is what he says. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. You see, God's authority and his glory and his power and his position of kingship over the whole world are unrivaled. They are absolute. And so he will rightly be intolerant of, or, or jealous of any rivalry to that position of power and authority. Because nothing can be God. And so anything that pretends or tries or strives to be God will fail. And so God rightly jealously guards the right, the position that he alone can fulfill as God. He tells his people in the Ten Commandments from number one, you shall not have any gods except for me. Don't worship anyone else. Don't give your lives to anything else because that worship and that glory rightly belongs to God. God is jealous for us. He's intolerant of rivalry when it comes to his glory. And it's because God loves us so much that he's jealous of what we worship and give glory to. Because the only thing our worship is worthy of is him. If we worship anything else, we're having second best. And that's why God is a jealous God, because he loves us. Uh, Charles Spurgeon, the great uh, preacher, says it this way. He says, let this jealousy which would keep us near to Christ, be also a comfort for us. For if he loves us so much as to care thus about our love, we may be sure that he will suffer nothing to harm us, and he will protect us from all our enemies. God is jealous, and that is for our good. Jealousy is also good when we guard something like marriage. I should be jealous for my wife. Not a petty jealousy that resents her, that's actually envy, which we'll come to in a moment, but an intolerance of rivalry in our, for my place in her life. I'm jealous of our relationship because of the vows we've made to each other. There is no one else on earth that can call Corinna a, 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 a wife, nor should there be. So I am intolerant of any rivalry for that, as Corinna should be for me. But jealousy becomes sinful when we want to guard something that's not necessarily ours. And we are afraid that someone is going to take that thing away. It's sinful when we introduce fear. It might be that position at work or our place in a friendship group or that particular skill we're known for, no one else, or for that power we want to hold on to. And the way we diagnose it is thinking about who do we want to see fail and why. So that's jealousy. It's subtly different to envy because jealousy is about guarding what we already have and envy is resenting what others already have. So, point two, envy. Envy is a painful or resentful awareness of an advantage enjoyed by somebody else. It's the resentment of that beautiful person because you don't feel attractive. It's looking at that happily married couple with bitterness because yours is struggling. It's seeing other people's children succeed and wishing yours would be more like them. It's subtly excluding that student who does really well in exams and in sport and that kind of stuff from your friendship group. Talking them down, undercutting them, tall poppy syndrome. Or that 
defensive retort that minimizes someone else's success. Or even thinking, why does he get to do a talk on envy? I could do a much better job. An American writer, Gore Vidal, said this, When a friend succeeds, a little part of me dies. And I think that just nails envy to the wall. Unlike jealousy, envy is always a sinful thing. It wishes you had what someone else already has. And it resents the person who has those things. So it's really important that we know how envy works. You see, it's most acute and most sinful in areas we value and with people who are most like us. We will envy most in areas we value with people who are most like us. So we can look at Roger Federer and we can know there's no way I can play tennis like him. I'm not even in his league, so I don't really envy him. But Bob the, down the road, who wipes me off the court every week, man, I envy him. Now, you might not be into tennis or sport at all, so you won't even envy anyone who's good in those areas. But there will be an, an area in your life that you treasure, one that you protect. And you're tempted to envy those most like you in that area. So we envy those most like us in areas that we value. Now for me, an area I value is doing this, is Bible teaching. So I will envy those most like me in this area. So I've got no problem with envy when I, th I think and watch and listen to talented and gifted global speakers like you know, a, a John Piper or a Don Carson because they're so different to me. But... The temptation to envy will be most acute when someone like me does well in an area I value. So Eddie down the road, who's a great preacher and runs an amazing youth group, I envy him. And I envy other people, their skills and opportunities and how God blesses them. I envy the size of youth groups. I resent their growth. I, I look for their failure. So what is that area for you? What is an area you most value? And who are the people most like you who do well in that area? Jerry Bridges, who wrote Respectable Sins, he, he writes this. Envy is most tempting when there are enough similarities for the differences to hit us in the face. When the person you're envying is similar to you in an area you, tre you treasure, our sinful nature cries out, Why them? Why not me? And we see this all the way through the Bible. Cain kills Abel out of envy, Genesis chapter 4. Genesis 25, Jacob is envious of Esau's birthright and so he gets Esau, he tricks Esau to sell it to him for a, for a bowl of soup. It was out of envy that David slept with Bathsheba and killed her husband in 2 Samuel 11. It's out of envy that the Pharisees saw Jesus raise someone from the dead and said, I'm, we are going to kill you. James 3.16 says, Where you have envy, there you find disorder and every evil practice. Envy feeds our sin and leads us around, the no around by the nose into more sin. Pro Proverbs chapter 14 verse 30 aptly sums it up when it says, A heart at peace gives life to the body, but envy rots the bones. Envy is like a cancer that eats us from the inside. And it's vile because, like jealousy, it poisons our relationship with others. It makes us ask the question, why them? Why not me? It creates bitterness when they look at others. So instead of rejoicing with others when they succeed, we, like Gore Vidal, say, a little piece of me died when you succeeded. Because I wanted it to be me. And if we don't deal with it, we don't confront the sin of envy it'll strangle our relationship with others and it will poison our relationship with God because what envy really exposes in us is the fact that we don't actually trust that God is good because if he was if he if he is good why doesn't he give me those good things that other people have why don't I have that thing that I want to have 
And we see this in the things that we envy in others. Usually they are things out of the person's control, but are gifts from God, their abilities, their looks, their intelligence, their opportunities. These are the things that God has given them that they haven't earned. But it's those things that we most are apt to envy. And what it does show is that I don't think God is good because he hasn't given those things to me. And so when we envy others, we get kind of like a tunnel vision that is always looking at others and is blind to the great things that God has given us. We doubt God's goodness and then we're blind to to, to what he does for us. And so that's why we need to change. Because envy, if we let it run rampant, will poison our relationship with others and it will poison our relationship with God. So how do we do that? This is where we'll finish. How do we slay the green-eyed monsters? Well, I think there are three very brief things to do to slay both envy and jealousy. First, we need to shine a light on them. We need to identify them where they are in our our lives. We uh, We need to look at who we are who we're wanting to fail and who um, we are envying and identify where envy and jealousy are present in our lives. You see, the problem is they're very insidious little sins that usually masquerade as other things. And so we need to ask ourselves, why are we angry when someone else succeeds? Or why do we resent what that other person has? Or why do we feel defensive when someone comes to us with a legitimate concern? Because behind those emotional responses usually lie Envy and jealousy. Another way to identify where envy and jealousy um, are present in life is to think about what areas of life you value and who might be skilled in those areas because that's the moment where we will be most envious of others. So shine a light on them. Diagnose them. Discover them in your lives. Look for them so we can confront them. Secondly, be thankful. Thankfulness is the sword that slays the monsters of envy and jealousy. If we are thankful, then we will put them to death in life. If we realize that God has given us an amazing gift of the gospel, that he's given us everything, every breath that we take, every atom that makes up our body is a gift from God, we will have our eyes open to just how much he does for us every single second. We will know how good he is and how he loves to lavish his his, his love on us. And in the light of our thankfulness to God, our envy will lose its attraction because we can see just how much God has given us already. Our jealousy will wither in the face of thankfulness because there's no need for us to fear others taking what is already ours because God gives us great gifts every day. So write a list of things that you can be thankful to God for and keep them close so that when you feel the pull of envy and jealousy, you can pull them out, read them, and be thankful once again for all that God has given us. So shine a light on it. Be thankful. Number three, follow Jesus together. Follow Jesus together. As Christians, we're not on different sides kind of competing for God's love. No, that's not how it works. His approval isn't given on the basis of our merit. No, he lavishes lavishes that on us by his grace. So as Christians, we're all on the same team. We're all following the same saviour. We're all walking in the same footsteps of of the same king. We're all working for the same goals, serving Jesus together. We see this in our passage that was read to us a little bit earlier from Titus chapter 3. Paul writes to Titus, who's leading a church, he says, Don't you know, at one time we all were foolish. We too were foolish. We too were disobedient. We too were deceived and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But, but, when the, sa- when the kindness and love of God our Saviour appeared, He saved us, not because of the righteous things we've done, but because of His mercy. 
He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, who he poured out for us through Jesus, our Savior. We all stand before God on the same level, in desperate need of his salvation. And we love to look to the left and the right to either put people down or claw ourselves up. But if we follow Jesus together, we will be united in a salvation that comes to us not by our merit, but by God's grace. And if we follow Jesus together, we will be united by his love for us and not separated by our envy and our jealousy. So, shine a light on it, be thankful, and follow Jesus together. Because envy and jealousy are respectable sins we love to tolerate, but we all struggle with them. But Jesus has died to pay for those sins, and God gives us the Spirit to help us to change. So let's pop the hood, check the oil, and make sure things are running smoothly. Let me pray. Almighty God, we ask that you would give us the strength to confront these sins that we tolerate. Help us to hate envy and jealousy in our lives and help us to love the salvation that you give us freely through your Son. Help us to repent and to turn in, to find forgiveness in you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Well, it's been great to spend this time together this morning, as I indicated at the start, to have been challenged and encouraged from God's Word about what it has to say to us about our tendency towards envy and jealousy, or both of which can live in our hearts. It's been great to be reminded of all that we have in the gospel of Jesus, of God's promises to us, and the reality that there is nothing that we need beyond Jesus. And our envy and our jealousy both come out of our tendency to think that we need something more than him. Let me end our time together by praying for us that with God's help, through his spirit, he will continue to weed out the roots of of jealousy and envy in our lives. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the time that we've been able to spend together this morning. We confess our envy and our jealousy. We know in our minds how foolish it is, and yet our hearts still harbor these things. We thank you for all that you are to us in Jesus and all that you have done for us in Jesus. We thank you for his spirit that is at work in us. And we pray that you continue to weed out the envy and the jealousy in our lives so that we might mirror Jesus more fully. And we pray that in his name. Amen. Thanks for joining with us today. We'll see you next week.